Hello, welcome to today's afternoon session. Yesterday, we have heard about indirect detection. And now it's time for direct detection. I'm delighted to, to introduce our lecturer today, which is actually a special person for me because he was my former co-supervisor at the Technical University of Munich. Uh, decades back. <laughs> yes, Professor Dr. Joseph Jochum from the Kepler Center for Astro and Particle Physics of the University of Tübingen in Germany. Professor Jochum received his doctor in physics from the Technical University of Munich in Germany. His field of interest are in particle as well as astroparticle physics including dark matter and neutrinos, and also detector development for astroparticle experiments. He has been involved in direct detection experiment, namely uh, CREST for wind detection, and also in MATMAX, an action, an action uh, dark matter detector. He has also involved in neutrinoless double beta decay de uh, detectors such as uh, Gerda and now Legend. Okay, uh, now let's invite Professor Jochum to deliver the lecture. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, good afternoon. Actually, it's good morning for me. I am in Germany. It's nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, thanks for having me uh, in your summer school. It's an honor to represent the direct detections in this school. Yes, and uh, well, I, I suggest we just right away start. I try to share the screen once again. Let's see. So you should see the slides now. I go to presentation mode. Whoops. Just one. Okay, so uh, I think you can see it. Uh, you can also see the point. Uh, let's see. So this is my point. Okay. Okay. So my, the topic of my lecture today is uh, direct search for dark matter. Um, so of course, you know, there is, uh, there is dark matter in the universe. And uh, for me as uh, coming from particle physics, the exciting thing of that, it's uh, clearly pointing to physics beyond the standard model. Actually, uh, even after the era of LHC and all these accelerators, we have not found in the laboratory any proof of physics beyond the standard model, even if we believe that it must be there, the only experimental or observational proof we have is actually dark matter. Maybe uh, the masses of neutrino is also hinting towards physics beyond the standard model, but the only solid proof that there should be something more than what we know about particle physics right now is actually dark matter. And that's why I, in the first part, uh, in my introduction, I would like to spend some time on, on the question, why is dark matter physics beyond the standard model? And that leads us to uh, actually what we should look for. And then in the second or in, in, in the later parts, uh, I actually go to the WIMP searches. So the two, the two particles I will discuss are WIMPs and a little bit at the end and actions as well. So, um, um, and uh, I will show you the main challenges in uh, the detector techniques, and then of course, something on axions. But let's start right away with the introduction. Why is dark matter physics beyond the standard model? Okay, you all know the, the usual uh, hints and, and observational proofs of, of uh, of dark matter, it's the most classical one are the rotational curves around galaxies. So this is the orbital speed of objects orbiting around galaxies. And this speed, according to the Keplerian law, should fall off, but it doesn't. And that shows you there is more uh, centripetal force than, than uh, what we see. So there must be mass around this galaxy. And since we don't see it, we call it dark matter. So this is the kinematical proof then there is a thing like the bullet cluster, which in the bottom line shows you that the gravitational potential can be where the visible matter is not. So the visible matter is here, but the center of the gravity potential is, is somewhere else. And that is strange. This cannot be 
So the center of gravity must be produced by something else which we do not see, and that's the dark matter. Another nice uh, illustration are the gravitational lenses. So here you see some, some examples. Here you see these arcs, which, is, which are the light from more distant galaxies than the one you see in the foreground. Uh, but the light of these distant galaxies is bent by the mass, by the gravity field of these uh, galaxies here. And uh, there is a relation between the radius of these arcs and the mass of the lens of this galaxy cluster. And this also shows that there must be more mass to create these this, uh, lenses here, these this, this pictures here. There must be more mass than we see. Okay, these are the standard, let's say, kinematical uh, proofs for dark matter. But the one I like most, and I think the most convincing actually, which brings it beyond uh, standard model, comes from cosmic microwave background. So the cosmic microwave background was created in the early universe when the universe was hot, uh, protons and electrons were still separated. But uh, at the time of 380,000 years after the Big Bang, they combined to hydrogen and produced photons. Uh, um, before, of course, they could produce that as well, but the universe was hot enough, so it had high enough energy photons to break the hydrogen again. So this was the time when, when it cooled down, so the hydrogen remained stable. We call that the recombination, but actually it was the first combination protons and electrons did, so it actually was the combination. Recombination only can occur later, but okay. So the, the, the thing is that before that happens, you have the universe full of charged particles and photons scatter on these particles. So the universe is intransparent. Photons cannot travel very far. After that happened, you have only uh, uh, uncharged particles, the hydrogens, and the photons have a, have a very long mean free pass. So the universe is then transparent. So if we look, if we, if we are here and we look further, further away, we also look earlier and earlier in the history of the universe, we see a transparent universe until we come to the time when this happened. And then we see a transition from a transparent universe to an intransparent universe. And this surface of last scattering, what we see, that's what we, where we see the anisotropy of the cosmic microwave background. So we can measure the microwaves coming from this surface of last scattering which show a perfect black body at two or roughly three Kelvin, which shows us that the universe was a thousand times smaller at that time. So this, this happens at the redshift of 1100 roughly. So the, the scale factor at that time was 1100 times smaller. But what we see on top of this uh, black body radiation is an isotropy in this temperature on the level of 10 to the minus five or 10 to the minus six. And this is the interesting part. This shows us the structure of the universe at that time. And this is an illustration in galactic coordinates where you see these variations uh, in, in, uh, in, in this temperature. And you can already see here a certain granularity which shows you the typical size of the structures at that time. And if you basically Fourier transform this pattern here, so in the simplest view, you would draw a line and along the line, you have an up and down and an up and down of this density or this temperature. And if you do a Fourier transform of that, you get a, a spectrum like this. And this is a famous cosmic microwave multipole spectrum. So here are multipoles. So this means the Fourier coefficient. So a high multipole means a high frequency. So these are small structures here. A small multipole L means a large structure. And this is basically the intensity of this structure. And you see peaks in this spectrum. And these peaks represent the status of oscillations in this early plasma of protons, electrons, and photons. And the first peak basically is a mode which had just enough time in this 380,000 years to go into maximum compression. So it looks like this. It's, it's a maximum compression. This is the first peak. And it took 400,000 years to do this maximum compression. The second peak is at the double the multipole. So this is half the size, double the frequency. So this means this had enough time 
to go into maximum compression and back in maximum expansion again. The third peak, three times the multipole, compression, expansion, and compression again. So we have a, we have a compression, decompression, compression, decompression, compression. So a, a alternating pattern of compression and decompression peaks in here and on the level of 10 to the minus five. And this is the structure basically when hydrogen formed and we must understand how all the structures we see today have formed from that. So this is the seed where we started, that's where we are today. And the question is, did this anisotropy grow to, to, to today's structure? And uh, you probably know about structure formation. Uh, I will do a very short recap on that because to, to understand how this anisotropy can grow to today's structures, one has to, to understand a little bit on structure formation. And uh, I do it very simple here. It's basically a classical mechanics, Newtonian picture of what I'm doing here. It's basically the same like uh, deriving sound waves in air. So we describe the universe by a density, by a pressure. The, the density elements have a speed and there is a gravity potential. So that's different. That's what you usually don't have in, in aerodynamics or hydrodynamics. So here we have oscillation, uh, basically sound waves in the presence of a gravity potential. So and you have a continuity equation, which tells you that the temporal change in the volume element is given by the flux in and out of this volume element. We have the so-called Euler equation, which is nothing else than Newton's law. So here's acceleration. It's the derivative of the speed. That's acceleration. And here are the, sorry, is there a question? No, okay. And here are the forces. So this is the pressure gradient and the gradient of the gravity potential. So that's gravitational force. And this is the force given by the pressure. And then we have the Poisson equation, which gives basically the gravity potential independence of the density. So now what you do, you linearize these equations. You say all these quantities have a solution with uh, the, the, the index zero. And then there's a small disturbation a small perturbation. So the row one is much smaller than the row zero. And it's true for all of them. And the zeros fulfill these equations. And then we define the so-called density contrast, which is given by the change of the density, the, the small variation given by the average density. So that's the quantity, the density contrast, we would like to see to grow from this early 10 to the minus five to today, huge number because today the density contrast is, in, in, uh, is very big. Okay, if you do your math, I don't do it here, if you plug it in and you say, okay, this, this delta is very small, you derive a wave equation for this delta, for this uh, density contrast. It's a classical wave equation. So this is the second derivative in time. Here's the second derivative in, 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 in position. Here's the sound speed. And usually you have a zero here. That's when you have sound waves. Then you have just a classical sound equation, uh, wave equation, sorry. The only difference here is that we have this term here on the right side, which is given by gravity, because different to sound waves, when we have a compression, we on not only have the pressure to, to make, to dilute this compression again, we also have gravitational force, which would like to let grow this compression. You know, when there is much mass somewhere, gravity would like to intensify that. So we have two competing forces here. This is the gravity on this side, which would like to grow densities. And we have the, this term here, which is basically coming from the pressure. Uh, this term here, would, which would like to decrease compressions. So usually if, if is a zero, when there is a zero here, you only have oscillations, sound waves. And actually, when this term here, this pressure term is bigger than this here, we are in this situation. Then densities only oscillate. We only have sound waves. That's what we see in this pattern of the cosmic microwave background. And we have no structure growth. Anything which will grow oscillates back and forth and back and forth. And that's the case as long as if if this term, this pressure term, is larger than this term. 
the gravity term. To make that a little bit more clear, um, um, okay, I, it's it's just uh, when you when you go in with into this wave equation, if you go in with uh, plane waves, you find this dispersion relation, and uh, you you see the temporal check behavior, which gives you oscillations or not. This omega is uh, positive or negative, or it's imaginary or real, depending if this term is larger than this term or not. This leads you to a, a maximum k or a minimum lambda, which you might know as the genes length. So this argument leads you to the genes length or the, the genes mass. You need a certain minimum mass or an object mass to have a certain minimum size to collapse. Otherwise, we will not have no have not structured growth. Okay, but again, so we have this wave equation and it only oscillates if this term is larger than this term. And this term comes, if you look at the particle picture, if you say, okay, your, your universe is set up of some particles, these particles have energies, they, might, they have kinetic energy and they have rest mass energy. And this term is large when this term this kinetic energy dominates. So for relativistic particles, we have pressure. Cosmologists say to relativistic particles, radiation. Everything which is relativistic, it's summarized as radiation. And radiation means this term dominates. So then the pressure term is much larger than the, or that the kinetic term is much larger than the rest mass term. The pressure is unequal zero and we only have oscillations. If you have non-relativistic particles, when this kinetic energy is much smaller, we have no pressure, and then we can have structure growth. So structure growth in the universe is only possible if you have non-relativistic particles, and if your particles are not bound to radiation. And the before a combination, the particles have a high pressure because they are coupled to the radiation because of their charge. And that means, in the baryons we see in the, or this matter we see in the cosmic microwave background are protons and electrons. Everything which with a charge, everything with an electric charge, we would see in the cosmic microwave background. That's, uh, so that's basically all our standard model particles, except neutrinos, uh, are participating in this cosmic microwave background oscillations. And this can, since they are coupled to radiation, they only oscillate. They oscillate, they oscillate, they oscillate until the recombination. Then we suddenly have hydrogen, non-relativistic, and only then the, the structure can start to form. So this is the density contrast. Before recombination, it only can oscillate, and then it can start to grow. Then this pressure term vanishes, and we have an equation like that. So this is a problem. So this means we, we have to understand our structure starting at recombination. And then if you say, okay, at this point, the pressure term vanishes. Okay, but uh, we had a simple picture. We did not take into account the expansion of the universe. If you do that, this equation uh, changes a little bit. You get an additional term. And then you can solve this equation for the time after recombination and ask the question, how is delta, delta growing now? How does it behave as a function of time? So you plug in R, which is the scale factor of the universe, in a meta-dominated universe, which we have after this recombination, it grows like T to the power of two third. And then you can solve delta, how delta grows with time, and you find it also grows like two third. So this means, when the density contrast starts to grow, it grows proportional to R. This tells us that since the recombination, R has grown by a factor of 1000 or 1100. So this means delta grows from recombination to today by a factor of 1000. Okay, if you take 10 to the minus 5, which we see here, times 1100, you end up at 10 to the minus 2. 10 to the minus two variation in density. This is a 1% variation on a homogeneous, otherwise homogeneous universe. That's not what we see today. We see today a, a huge number. We need this number must be 10 to the four, or 10 to the five, not 10 to the minus two. So 
from the baryons we see here, we cannot understand how this structure of today can have grown. It's impossible to grow that in that time. So the only way out is that there must have been an at least 100 times larger anisotropy, which we cannot see in the CMB. If there was such a large anisotropy, if there was already at recombination, then it must be made out of particles without electromagnetic interaction. Otherwise, we could see it in the cosmic microwave background. So the only way out here is that we have a dark matter, meaning a matter without electromagnetic interaction, which started structure formation much earlier. So the picture then is, we have this dark matter starting structure formation because it had no pressure. Then the, the electromagnetic interacting matter, cosmologists call that baryonic, dark, uh, baryonic matter. So the baryonic matter oscillates, 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 oscillates. After recombination, also this baryonic matter can form structures, but it falls into the structures the dark matter has already prepared. And the only electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic particles in the standard model are neutrinos. But the neutrinos are still relativistic at the time of recombination. Their pressure term is still too big at that time. So they cannot be the solution. We need something which is non-relativistic long before that. And that usually tells, asks for heavier dark matter, or at least dark matter which is non-relativistic at that time. Okay, so if that is the case, then these oscillations which we saw before, these compressions and these expansions and these compressions, these are compressions of baryons which fall into the potential wells prepared by the dark matter. So there is already a structure which is static, which doesn't oscillate, and the baryonic oscillations we see fall into these wells and have to climb out of these wells. So, and if you look at the pattern here and you draw an average exponential decay of, this, of these peaks, you see that if you draw such a line, the first and the third peak is higher, the second and the fourth peak is lower. And that shows what I'm saying that, or actually this, this, this is a visible proof of dark matter actually, because it tells you that the compression peaks somehow are enhanced by something and the decompression peaks are weakened by something. And this discrepancy between the even and the odd peaks shows you that there is a structure, a static structure of non-charged matter already existing when this oscillations happens. So there are charged part, so the, the charged particles oscillate in a background of non-oscillating gravity field. So this gravity field is made of neutral particles, which started structure formation much, much earlier. And this is a proof. So here you can see dark matter by eye. And that's a proof of physics beyond the standard model must be at work here, because the standard model doesn't provide the particles to explain that. Actually, this picture is much, much nicer if you draw it in a double logarithmic shape, then this exponential decay is a line. And here you clear, that's the same picture as before, just double logarithmic. And you see this, this discrepancy between the even and the odd peaks. So what we are looking for uh, are massive particles, non-luminous, non-baryonic, cold, which means non-relativistic, either heavy or so heavy that they are non-relativistic already at that time, or non-relativistic born. They must be stable with respect to the lifetime of the universe, and they are only weak or less interacting with ordinary matter. Okay, so uh, when we come to the detection, actually the question is how many dark matter do we have here and what are the properties? So if, if this is our solar system, we, we know something. We know that the, the sun is circulating around the galactic center. So we have a distribution like it fall, a halo of dark matter around our galaxy. So, and this, the speed distribution follows a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution that comes from the structure formation of the, of the galaxy. 
So it's actually not a thermal distribution, but it looks like a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. And the most probable dark matter speed in that corresponds to the speed the solar system is orbiting around the galactic center, and these are 220 kilometers per second. The escape velocity from, from our galaxy is 540 kilometers per second. So any particle which is faster than this can evaporate away from our galaxy. So we, we assume the distribution to be cut off um, there. And then there is a variation in the speed distribution of a few percent due to the orbiting Earth around the sun. So in summer, our speed adds to the speed of the sun. In winter, it is subtracted. And then uh, if this is a picture of the Milky Way from above, we are somewhere here. And uh, from simulations and calculations and measurements of the rotational speeds in, in, of objects in our galaxy, we can de derive the density of dark matter at our position. And this corresponds to 0.3 GeV per cubic centimeters. So this means if we have a 100 GeV dark matter particle, we must have three per liter. So if you have one liter, a bottle of one liter, so this is roughly one liter. And uh, if the dark matter particles have 100 GeV, there are three particles in this bottle all the time, but they are not static. They have a speed uh, which, which, uh, which is given basically by, by the rotational speed of the Earth around the sun. Okay, the next uh, thing uh, is what are the candidates? So we know it's beyond the standard model, but uh, what are possible ideas, of course? And there is a huge variety of ideas. So, you know, theoreticians are very imaginative and they can imagine a lot of particles. And some are more motivated, some are a little bit less motivated, and the, the fashions can change from time to time. For example, 20 years ago, the classical WIMP was very fashionable because we expected supersymmetry to be at work. And the LHC at CERN was built to look for supersymmetry. And supersymmetry provides very natural candidates for WIMPs. So WIMPs are here. So these are basically the interaction of this dark matter particle with ordinary matter. And this is the mass of the particles. And you see, it, we have ideas about many, many orders of magnitude in mass and many, many orders of magnitude in, in interaction with ordinary matter. And WIMPs are here, and uh, I will talk a little bit out about WIMPs. And then there are things like the axion, which I think is also extremely well motivated, why at the end I will talk a little bit about axion as well. So I will mainly talk about WIMPs and axions. And uh, okay, there are other particles like the axino, they are from supersymmetry, they are no more fashionable anymore. Gravitino is, is a possibility which is uh, also from supersymmetry. Then there are very heavy particles, could as well be, but they are very difficult to detect. Here are still neutrinos. They are meanwhile excluded also from direct detection experiments. And as I said, they are they, are, they don't help because they are too relativistic, uh, because they are too light. They are too relativistic at the time of recombination and cannot form the structures. Axions actually are even lighter, but their production mechanism is such that they are born cold, they are born non-relativistic. So that's an escape from having a light mass, but still being a heavy, a cold dark matter candidate. Okay, so then let's come to the Next point, which is uh, uh, WIMP searches. So let me see where we are in time. So I better jump here a little bit. 30, 30. Sorry. I'm, uh... Okay, so what are we looking for? We are looking for a direct detection means we hope this WIMP is there and this, this hope is justified because the Earth sits in the Milky Way and the Milky Way is embedded in a halo of dark matter. So if this dark matter has an interaction with, with ordinary matter, which by the way is also well motivated because to bring dark matter into the universe in the thermal bath at the Big Bang, you need some interaction with standard model particles. You need some interaction. Otherwise, 
you do not have a production mechanism to bring it into life, to, 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 to make uh, dark matter existing. And the interesting thing is, if you make the interaction with ordinary matter weaker, you are left with more of the dark matter particles. So that's why uh, we, we think to, if, if the dark matter would have extremely low interaction with standard model particles, this would mean we would have a huge amount of dark matter. So we, so, and from the dark matter we see, we can even give limits to the interaction with normal matter. So this dark matter must have at least a minimum interaction with the dark matter, with, with ordinary matter, which is in the order of the weak scale. So we could hope that such a dark matter particle, a WIMP, can scatter with a nucleus and kick it, give it some, some speed. So all the standard detection mechanisms like ionization don't work because this particle is not charged, but we can hope for an interaction with a nucleus to give a nucleus a little bit kinetic energy. So we look for elastic scattering of nuclei from WIMPs. WIMPs stands for weakly interactive massive particles. So we need some weak interaction. We need this, this particle to be massive, to be cold dark matter, and we want it to scatter elastically from, uh, from nuclei. So we look for nuclear uh, recoils. And uh, the mass is, uh, is in the order of one for GeV to 1,000 GeV. So it is comparable to the nucleus. A nucleus has, let's say, 100 GeV mass, and the WIMP has the same. The relative speed is 270 kilometers per second, which is roughly one thousandth of the light speed. And if this WIMP is as heavy as the nucleus, the maximum kinetic energy transfer is that the WIMP transfers all its kinetic energy to the, to the nucleus. And this is a few keV of energy. So this is the first big challenge for direct detection. A few keV energy is a very low energy for detectors. In addition, this is a few keV of energy in a nuclear recoil. And a nuclear recoil, other than an electron of this energy or other than a photon of this energy, has a reduced efficiency for charge or light production. No, All... Hello? Okay. So if, if there is a problem, please interrupt me. So uh, the, the detectors work with charge or light production. So you ionize a gas or you ionize a semiconductor or you produce light in a, in a scintillator. But these are all interactions from electromagnetic interaction. And this is uncharged and this nucleus also is uncharged. So it has a reduced efficiency of charge or light protection. So this makes the detection of a few keV of energy even harder. The next problem is the rate you can expect. So from the cross sections, and the local WIMP density and the local WIMP flux, you can calculate how many scatterings you can expect. And that's a very, very low rate. It's, uh, you, you immediately end up with one per week per kilogram. And actually today's sensitivity is much, much better than this. We are down to one per year per kilogram or even below now. So it's extremely low rate. So low energy, low rate, these are the challenges. And uh, the low rate is a challenge because um, you, you need to shield it. You, you need to shield your experiment from, from other radiation, which causes signals. And first, there is the cosmic radiations. From cosmic rays, which hit our atmosphere, there are many, many muons being produced in the atmosphere. Actually, there are 100 per square meter per second on the Earth. And if you put a detector on, in your laboratory, it will be hit several times a second by cosmic ray muons. And you need to reduce that to a level of one event per year. And this means you have to reduce the muon flux by a factor of a million or so. And this requires 1.5 kilometers of rock. Yes, and this means this puts all these direct detection experiments in underground laboratories. Otherwise, you are overwhelmed by uh, cosmic rays. But even then, if you are underground, your detector will uh, fire a lot of signals 
because of ambient radioactivity. So there is almost no material which doesn't contain, contain some uranium or some thorium. Or potassium is also abundant. Potassium is also a radioactive element which is even in, in your body. So the main radioactivity in your body comes from potassium. And if you touch something, your fingerprint contains potassium, which is enough to disturb an experiment on that level. So you need to reduce the environmental radioactivity a lot. And that's why direct detection experiments are an art in selecting materials, in choosing your proper materials. You even need to clean the air from radioactivity. And you have to do a very, very careful shielding of your detectors from the surrounding. Okay, this brings me to the end of my first part, which means only I have to switch to swap the files. Let me just for a second, hello, it's me. So if you wish, you could ask questions right now, but I will swap the file, which will take only a few seconds. You are still here. I don't hear anybody. Hesti, you are yes. still listening? Yes, we still have no questions. So if you okay, okay, that's you fine. Go ahead. Okay, I go ahead. Okay, so I come to the second part right now. So I have always 45 minutes slots or, uh, of files. That's why, okay, now we are in the second part. And I think I have time to go into an example of background just to illustrate what it means. Um, let me spend a few minutes on, on one of the examples. So we want to see a few counts per day in an experiment. That's actually a picture of the Crest experiment. This is a cryostat. I will come to that later. And uh, <clears throat> so, as I said, the surrounding of your laboratory has uranium in it. And uh, we need a lot of shielding against these gammas. Since we need a lot of shielding against gammas anyway, it's enough to consider the highest energy gamma. Because we need to shield the highest energy gamma. The, then the low energy gammas will also be shielded away. So if you have a thick shielding, all the low energies is shielded, but the highest energy is the most penetrating. And the highest energy gamma in the uranium thorium chains is a 2.6 MeV gamma from, uh, from thallium. And uh, okay, here are the numbers, but if you go through the numbers, you will find that one gram of thallium produces four, sorry, one gram of thorium produces of this 2.6 MeV four times 10 to the 10 counts per day. So one gram brings you 40 billion counts per day. So this is the number. Now, contaminations of thorium in rock. Let's look for rock because we are in an underground laboratory. So we have rock around us. So a typical contamination of thorium in rock is 10 to the minus six grams per gram. So one, one gram in one ton of material. So the laboratory, let's have the laboratory, make it simple. Let be the laboratory a cube of 10 by 10 by 10 meters. This means we see 600 Yosef, square meters. Yes, yes, sorry. Uh, yeah. Can you change the mode? We, because we can see your notice. <laughs> ah, we see. Ah, sorry. Ah, <laughs> this is okay. Sorry. I, you see my notes. Okay. Let me just uh, stop. Okay. You're right. Thank you. I should have realized. I see it. I don't know why this happened. But let's see. I have to stop this, I guess. Okay. Thanks for telling me. So that's uh, okay. Let me try again. Let me go back to the background. So now, okay. Uh, it's it's still you still see and I I but I need my I need this you. So now you should now it's fine, all right? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So let me let me go back again. So we we I told you that one gram of thorium produces these four times ten to the ten counts. And then uh, a rock has a contamination of 10 to the minus six grams of thorium per gram of rock. Then the lab has a size of 10 by 10 by 10 meters, which means we see 600 square meters of rock around us. A 2.6 MeV gamma has in rock roughly a mean free pass of five centimeters. 
So we see the rock in this light of this photon five centimeter deep. So we see 600 square meters by five centimeters. We basically see these are 30 cubic meters of rock are visible in this gamma light. So these are 100 tons of rock around us emitting these photons. With the contamination of 10 to the minus six, we have 100 grams thorium around us. So that's, that's normal. That's in, also in any building, you have that around you. So and this brings us to four times 10 to the 12 counts from the laboratory walls in this 2.6 MeV gamma. So this number here. So let's assume 1% of this goes into the direction of your experiment. Most of them go in all directions. They don't hit your experiment, but let's, let's assume a 1%. So this still uh, gives us a number of 10 to the 10. And we want to see a few counts per day. And this already tells you that you need to reduce the photons, these 2.6 MeV gammas, by a factor of 10 to the 9 or 10 to the 10 or so. So you need to reduce it by 9, 10 orders of magnitude. Um, the logarithm of 10 to the 9, the natural logarithm, is roughly 20. This means we need 20 times the mean free pass of this photon. And the simplest way to shield your experiment is by using water, because that's an inexpensive shielding material. In water, the 2.6 MeV photon has a mean free pass of 25 centimeters. You need 20 times this way. So you need four to five meters of water around you to shield your experiment. So that's why all these experiments, or most of these experiments today, sit in huge 10 meter diameter water tanks. You start with a 10 meter diameter water tank and put your experiment inside. And that's because of mainly two of these gammas to, to reduce them to the level which we want to see. Okay, so now uh, let me see where I go. Okay. Okay, so uh, this is, uh, was the question of the low scattering rate. Now let's come to the low energy, which is also a challenge. Uh, if you look to the, if you calculate the energy spectrum you expect, so the, which is the rate per recoil energy. So this is the spectrum you expect. You can calculate that. And the calculation is basically given by, okay, it's a cross section. So this is particle physics. Here your model of the WIMP in particle physics goes in, which tells you which cross section you have. Then you take the speed distribution of the particles around the Milky Way. So that's astrophysics. So that's basically the halo distribution. This is also astrophysics. And you convolute that and you get a spectrum. Before I show you the spectrum, uh, again, it gives you a recoil energy in the EV to KEV range. But uh, what I want to say here still is that given this cross section, you can have, you can have two possibilities which are mainly considered. So usually we are at low energies, we are non-relativistic, we assume an energy independent cross section and it can be spin independent. This means you scatter coherently on all nucleons or all, all, on all quarks in your nucleus. And this gives you a coherence factor of A squared because the energies are so low that the wavelength or the, the Broglie wavelength is larger than the nucleus so you get the coherence factor and this enhances the sensitivity. So you have a, a higher cross section here if you have larger nuclei. That's why usually this is the most popular look at in dark matter searches. But you can also be spin dependent, depending on the properties of your WIMP you are looking at. And then only one nucleon, the, the unpaired nucleon is, uh, is, cross, is responsible for the scattering. This could be an unpaired neutron or an unpaired proton, and you are much less sensitive. But you look to different kinds of WIMP particles. So that's why both are looked at, but this is the most, uh, yes, the most uh, fashionable one. Okay, the spectra, they look featureless on a double logarithm or on a logarithmic scale. This, the recoil spectra just look exponential. So they look like a line. So they look exponential. So this is an exponential spectrum. In a semi-logarithmic plot, this is a line. And it's peaking towards low energy. And if you make the WIMP lighter and lighter, so you go here from pink to black, the WIMP gets lighter and lighter and lighter. The recoil energies get lower and lower and lower. 
So you need to be able to see these low energy scatters and they are even lower as lower the wind masses. So a low detection threshold is, is the thing you need for wind nucleon scattering. It's crucial for scattering. Okay, because the techniques are so challenging, uh, there is a huge variety of dark matter searches and I do not want you to read this here. This is just the list of present running dark matter experiments. And you can understand from this list that I cannot go through all of them. So there are liquid xenon experiments, there are liquid argon experiments, there are sodium iodine experiments, there are germanium experiments, there are cryogenic experiments, there are bubble chamber experiments, there are gaseous experiments, and there are solid state uh, CCD experiments. So uh, there's a huge variety and this variety is good because we do not know what we look for and all these have their advantages and disadvantages. I will show you the main two ones, the liquid noble gas detectors and the cryogenic detectors and a few words on sodium iodine as well. So this is a plot which shows you the year versus the sensitivity or the limit on the cross section which was reached in that year. And you see, it ha it's, there is an impressive progress being done uh, over the years where the detectors get better and better and better. And this slope started in the 90s or so. And this came because of the development of techniques to largely reduce the background by the detectors themselves. And they have to do with particle identification. And I told you that uh, it's a disadvantage that nuclear recoils, the signal we are looking at, uh, produce less light or less ionization than electromagnetic interacting particles. This is a disadvantage because it pushes the recoil energy spectrum to even lower energies, but it can be used to recognize, to distinguish nuclear recoils from radioactivity because radioactivity is mainly alpha, but it's alpha, beta and gamma radiation. They have a high yield in ionization and scintillation light. And if you can measure this yield, you can distinguish between the two. So you can reject most of the background. And to reject the background is you use different detection channels. So the classical detection channel is using charge. So this is ionization detectors or light. This is scintillation detectors. A new player which was developed actually for dark matter searches are cryogenic detectors, which look for phonons. Basically for, they do either calorimetry or they look for the phonons, the lattice vibration in a solid created by this, this nuclear recoil. And uh, if you combine the two, if you combine two of them, so you not only measure then the energy, you also measure the ratio between the two. So you can measure the ratio between phonons and charge or the ratio between phonons and light. And this ratio depends on the ionization yield. And this is then a tool to distinguish between nuclear recoils and electromagnetic interactions, which, uh, which are the background. And uh, this development where started in the 90s and this uh, caused then this steep uh, increase in the sensitivities. And uh, phonons and charge, whenever there is phonons involved, these are cryogenic detectors and there are detectors using phonons and charge and there are detectors using phonon and light. And then charge and light is the domain of the liquid noble gas detectors, which uh, lead the field at present because they, as I will show you, they are the easiest to scale up to large, large detector volumes. Okay, that's why I now come to the liquid noble gas detectors. Okay, so liquid noble gas is, let's, let's assume you have a container which is filled with liquid argon or liquid xenon. These are the two players. So this is the liquid here. And then you have a gas above it. Then you, if, if there is a particle interacting in this liquid, there is the nice feature of this liquid noble gases that they scintillate. And you produce also free electrons. So you ionize, you ionize this liquid noble gas and you produce light. 
The light you can immediately detect with photomultipliers. So there is a photomultiplier array at the top and there's a photomultiplier array at the bottom. And you can see in the top and the bottom, you see the hit pattern of the photons being emitted from this event. So you have already an immediate signal of the event. So here is time going from bottom to top. You have an immediate uh, scintillation signal. But you also produce charges. And now if you manage to measure these charges as well, and then you get a second signal, uh, which measures the ionization. And this is done by applying a uh, electric field to this liquid, and then these charges drift. Yes. And uh, if they drift to the surface of the liquid, you can extract them out of the liquid, and then they make the gaseous noble gas scintillate. So you get a second scintillation signal from the gas when the charges are drifted into the gaseous phase. And this takes some time. This takes the drift time for the charges to reach the surface. And then you get a second signal, which actually is larger than the first one. So you get two signals. And the nice thing is that the ratio between the two signals depends on the ionization yield. And nuclear recoils and electronic recoils have a different ratio between the two signals. So from the ratio of the two signals, you can say this was a nuclear recoil or this was a, 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 a radioactivity. And if you plot that, I'm sorry, you cannot read the axis, but this is a number which basically is the ratio between signal one and signal two. And this is the energy here. And blue are electronic recoils. So it's caused by alpha, beta, gamma rays. And red are nuclear recoils, which you can measure in the experiment uh, in using a neutron source. If you apply a neutron source you to your detector, you produce nuclear recoils, and then you can measure the response of your detector. And you see red and blue are not laying over each other. The, the, the one is higher, the one is lower, and you can separate the two, at least a little bit. You know, there is an overlap. But down here, you are in a clean nuclear recoil region. And up here, you are in a clean, clean electron recoil region. So this is the trick you use here. And uh, uh, by the way, you also, by, by this uh, light pattern, you get the position in x, y direction. And by this drift time, the time between the first, sorry, the first and the second signal, you get the set position. So you can even. Uh, see where in 3D where your signal was in this detector. And the big advantage of liquid xenon detectors or liquid argon detectors is they can easily be scaled up. So it's, it's, it's easier to build a huge, it's very easy to build a bigger, bigger experiment as long as you can make the charges drift to the liquid. So this is the challenge there. If you make the detector bigger, your drift paths get longer and this might cause you a Problem, but okay, that's the, the only challenge then. Okay, and uh, the experiments are the Xenon experiment, which is a US European collaboration, and it's at Gran Sasso. It has already results of a one ton detector and is presently preparing uh, several ton detectors. And there are other several ton detectors in preparation. One is LZ at, uh, at US, this is led by US and UK institutions. And then there's Panda X in China. This is Xenon experiments. There are also Argon experiments, namely most famous is the dark side. We also proposing a ton scale uh, uh, liquid argon detector. It's being set up at Gran Sasso and there's deep clean uh, it, at Snow Lab. They have already a, a one ton detector running. Okay, but as an example, I would like to show you uh, the, the Xenon experiment. Uh, oh, I'm out of time. Okay, I'm a little late, I guess. Okay, it's a xenon experiment. This is sketch. So this is the tank where the detector sits in, in the water. So this is the 10 meter, meter tank. The detector is in here, well shielded through the, the water. Then there is an additional housing which contains a purification system. So another advantage of liquids is you can circulate a liquid and continuously purify it. Then you have a data acquisition and some storage. Xenon is an experiment, it's a huge experiment. There's a worldwide collaboration of, of, you see, almost 30 institutions. 
and uh, it started already uh, yes, 15 years ago or 20 years ago with a 15 kilogram prototype then it increased in size we are presently here and they are preparing this six ton device at Gran Sasso uh, in Italy and the, 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 while the active mass increased the sensitivity so the background was reduced and reduced and reduced and you see here we are on a level this says background in the region of interest in events per ton per year per kev we are on the level of a few hundred events per ton per year so this is less than one count per year in a kilogram detector this is this is fantastic if you run a kilogram of detector in your lab at the university you have a thousand counts per per second and they have less than one per year so this is a huge achievement in, in sensitivity and that's what you need to look for dark matter particles okay what they do they measure a while and then they have this plane of the ratio of these two signals and the, the, the nuclear recoil energy they have um, a region where they expect background and they have a region where they expect the wimps these are these black lines these black contours contours and this yellow is just where they expect the background then they can study what backgrounds do they expect they expect electronic recoils they expect neutrons also radioactivity in the surrounding laboratory wall produces neutrons they expect uh, they expect neutrinos from the sun the solar neutrinos also can scatter in these detectors and uh, maybe in 10 years of now this will be a background uh, today it's it's still so you see so here do you see the numbers they expect they expect very low numbers so less than one count so the, but from electron recoils they expect something and from neutrons they expect something and these different columns here is if they use the full detector or if they do a cut in the positioning so if you cut away the surfaces, most of the background, the electron recoils mainly come from the surface of the detector. They come from outside into the tank. So you see, if you take the full tank, they have this number. But if they cut and take a smaller radius, and they can do that because they have this 3D position resol uh, resolution, you so the number goes much, much down. Okay, and, and from the expectations, how these backgrounds are distributed and so on, they do a likelihood analysis where where they have the best chances to see a wimps versus the the background and then they define a region of interest in this plot so these are these two red lines here uh, sorry you do not see it I, I use my pointer so these are these two red lines here uh, where they expect the wimps and these are the backgrounds here so this is the best region where they expect the wimps and what they do so this is the data so they expose their one ton detector for two years or so and this is the data they get so this is the data in terms of this ratio of the signals and the energy and this is the 3d position resolution and you see these electron recoils here they are distributed all over the detector these low energy events here they come from the surface so if they do a cut they get rid of a lot of the background and this is the region where they expect the WIMPs and they, they do a so-called blind analysis. That's a state of the art for all of these experiments right now. So your region of interest is blinded while you do the analysis. So you, nobody in the collaboration sees signals in this region, but one has to define all the procedures, how the data is analyzed. One has to decide where one does the cut in radius. One has to decide when one does cut against noise and all these selection criteria are defined before you unblind this region then you unblind the, so this is to to avoid a bias to avoid a bias to enhance a signal which is not there for example so that's why a blind analysis is state of the art right now so uh, and then you unblind and what you find are uh, some counts so these are these numbers here and from their likelihood of all the backgrounds and the likelihood of, of electron recoils, the distribution they have in this plane, and the likelihood of WIMPs in this plane, they even can give a likelihood of, of each count, whether it's a WIMP or not. So you see in each count here, it has a pie chart pattern. 
And uh, this, this tells you, so this has a high likelihood of being a WIMP. This has a li higher likelihood coming from the surface and so on. So this, for example, is certainly coming from the surface. So it has a, it has a very low likelihood being a WIMP. And from all these likelihoods, they, they get, so they have several counts here and they can tell then in the end, okay, maybe f maximum five of this could be from WIMPs or so. And this uh, allows them to, to put limits on the cross sections of the WIMPs in the dark matter. And this is then the final result they can publish. So this is the axis of the WIMP mass. And this is of axis of the interaction strengths between the WIMP and the nucleus. So this is the spin independent cross section with the nucleus. And you pick a certain WIMP mass, let's say 100 GeV, and then you increase the cross section more and more and more. And then at some point you would say, okay, now with this high cross section, I would see more signals than I have seen in my experiment. That's why you can exclude all the cross sections here. You cannot exclude cross sections below this line. And you do that for each WIMP mass, and this gives you this line of exclusion. So this is the limit line. Everything above is excluded, everything below is allowed. So this is then the final result, that's the limit. So none of the experiments yet had, has found a WIMP, but they give better and better uh, exclusion lines like this. And in this plot I showed before, this puts xenon one ton to, to the top here at the beginning, so this here are projects. So these open circles are all projects, but xenon one ton is here with the real data. So with a real result. Okay, and as I explained before, uh, they can also do spin dependent analysis. So there the limit cross sections are not yet, uh, uh, are not, the numbers are not so good, but uh, you can do this for neutrons, for unpaired neutrons or unpaired protons. And also there, uh, Xenon is, is world leading and, and has the best limits. So uh, uh, these are, these, oh no, not here. In the, in the neutrons only, they have the best limits. In protons only, the, the PICO experiment is, is a little bit better. So, but of course, in, in this year, in the standard uh, spin independent analysis, Xenon has by far the best limits. And given the sensitivity here at this WIMP mass is the world leading sensitivity at the moment. Okay, um, so what's the future of liquid noble gas detectors? As I said, uh, Xenon uh, is setting up an, a six ton experiment. It's called Xenon N ton and it's under construction and will start data taking soon. Then there's the LZ experiment, which is actually a combination of the previous Lux and Zeppelin experiments. And they have funding for a seven ton xenon experiment uh, in the US. There is the dark side liquid argon experiment, one ton being set up at Gran Sasso. And there's the one ton liquid argon set up at, at also at Snow Lab, which is mainly Canadian experiment. So there's a lot of activity going on. And uh, these are the most promising in the WIMP mass region of around 100 GeV. So that's the classical WIMP region actually. And that's why these experiments, especially the Xenon experiment, are the most cited ones at the moment. Okay, um, now I'm, I think something went wrong. I'm even faster, Hesti. Okay, so uh, then uh, this is the same plot as before. So this is WIMP nucleon cross section, and this is WIMP mass, and uh, but it's now on a logarithmic scale. So that's why the xenon limit here is uh, only in this corner here. And you see all the experiment before. So you see how, what a huge uh, progress uh, was done orders of magnitude. So uh, at the beginning, so this, this were the CDMS experiments. At the time, it was the best one. Then the xenon experiments came up, putting this line, this line, this line. So over the years, in this, in this region above 10 GeV, there was a lot of progress being made and it's led by the xenon experiment, by the liquid uh, uh, noble gas experiments. But if there's also growing interest in low mass WIMPs, so at lower, and at, at, uh, below uh, 10 GeV. And uh, 
this is uh, there you need as i will show you you need a lower and lower energy threshold and this is still the domain mainly of cryogenic detectors you see experiments here like super cdms and you see the crest experiments and i will tell you in the next section about uh, these experiments um about the cryogenic experiments uh, uh, and uh, at let's say 10 years ago they were leading the field they were then overtaken by the liquid xenon experiments in the high mass region but uh, they are now left put to the corner may let's say here to the low mass wimp region and and the interesting thing is uh, this low mass wimp region also it was absolutely uh, unfashionable at the times when one believed in uh, in in supersymmetry because from the accelerator one, one was assuming the wimp mass should be higher and higher because the accelerators went up in energy didn't find anything so the wimp mass went higher and 20 years ago nobody believed that the wimp can be lighter than let's say 50 gev but uh, after lhc looking for supersymmetry not finding anything the ideas about one had one has to develop newer and newer ideas on the on the dark matter properties and actually there were new ideas coming for for low mass wimps and uh, i will explain that a little bit to give a motivation why we look for low mass wimps and then explain uh, how these uh, cryogenic detectors work okay actually i'm at the end of part two right now we could do a questionnaire section or i could continue for a few minutes hesti that's up to you to decide okay uh, we still have two questions here maybe i'll ask uh, let's see uh, oops with um, is it stc So maybe the first question um, from Hassan Zaki Yusuf. Hello. Yes. Can you, hear me? Hello. You, you want to ask your question by yourself? Uh, yeah, I got my question, but I think it's already answered. Uh, the, okay. I'm gonna rephrase. I think uh, to the question: uh, Is there any mega project such as CERN, LIGO, that try to find uh, dark matter by direct detection right now? Because I'm trying to. Maybe try to follow, see the story, what are they doing, try to find further information about it. But you already said about xenon and stuff, but maybe if you want to yes. say it again, it's up to you, yes. But I think yes, you already so, answered the question. Yeah, yeah, so the biggest projects at the moment are xenon, LZ, <coughs> and dark side. And actually, there is uh, something beyond, which I didn't mention yet. So there are plans. Uh, there are plans to put after the next round. So when, when all the experiments have finished, say, let's say five ton or six ton detectors, there are plans to put all the efforts together. Actually, all the experiments would like to combine their forces afterwards to build a, a huge, let's say several 10 tons, 30 ton detector. And that's called Darwin. Darwin? Darwin, yes. If you if you Google Darwin dark matter searches, this is is still okay. This is still an idea. It's still in the design phase, but it's being prepared, and there's already funding for it. So if you if you would like to do a a career in dark matter searches in direct detection, you should probably look to Darwin. Yes, that's good. Yes, thank you. Yes. And the, the idea is to to go even bigger, yes, and uh, and then uh, to do to to do a ten ton experiment or a twenty ton experiment. And it's still open if it's xenon. Of course, there are experimental issues between xenon and argon. So uh, this is still open if it's xenon or argon in the end. Okay. Uh, second question is from. Nishal Mahar Maharjan. Nishal Maharjan, are you here? Hello. Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Professor, for such a wonderful. Uh, so my question is, 
how confident can we be in the results produced by genome experiments if we only get few counts per ton per year? What does statistics look like in such experiments? Thank you. Okay. Uh, that's an interesting question. So, uh, so you ask how confident can we be if we have only a few counts? So uh, the thing is, maybe I go back, let's, let me see. Uh, I try to uh, go back a little bit. So if I, uh, okay, sorry, I, I have a problem here. I cannot, just a second. I have to stop something here. Sorry about that, uh, I, I'm back in a second. <laughs> okay, let's see, where are we here? Okay, if you look at this picture here, okay, if you. So, okay, so this is basically the result of the experiment. This is the ratio of the two signals, and this is the energy they measure. And the good thing is you have counts everywhere here. You have counts here, you have counts here. Of course, this is all background. You dislike that, but uh, we have some understanding of these backgrounds and actually so, so from the study of the spectrum of this background and the temporal behavior and so on, you can compare it to simulations, what you expect from the backgrounds. And from that, you can then see, okay, this looks exactly from what you expect. So you expect this distribution in space. You have some problems at the surface, so, but you expect that, and that's here at the surface and in energy is distributed everywhere. So this, this background, it's a nuisance, but it tells you the detector works. It functions. And it tells you, you would see a WIMP scatter. If a WIMP would scatter a nucleus, you would see it. And you would see it in this region. So from this, you can be extremely confident. You cannot only be confident, you can prove it by experiment in using neutron sources. You can generate on purpose nuclear recoils and you find them here. That's actually which was done. Let me see if I can jump to that. I only need the number. Just a second. This picture here is the same plot, the ratio of the two signals versus energy. And then you can put a neutron source next to your detector and then you see these red points here. And these are the nuclear recoils. So you can prove, you can prove the detector works. That's the first thing which, which is very important. So that's, you can be confident that you would see a WIMP if it had enough in action strings. Then you see a few counts. Okay, and then you are unsure. Can you claim this is, you have seen a WIMP? Or is there a certain likelihood that your backgrounds could generate these counts? And that's where the sensitivity comes in. Now you do a careful analysis and you say, okay, what's the likelihood that these backgrounds, which you have studied very well, what's the likelihood that, that these backgrounds can produce the counts you see here? Yes, and that gives you then the, the confidence, okay, if to a certain extent, this, this could be background, but if the WIMP would scatter more and more, it would be, uh, it would show a higher rate. So you can, ex so if you see five counts, you can exclude that the WIMP does 50. Or yes, that's, you can exclude. And this gives you then this plot here. So this is the line of confidence where one can say, okay, a WIMP cannot scatter up here. Of course, so, so in this sense, if, if your question was, how confident can we be that the WIMP uh, is excluded in this region, 
I think we can be very, very confident. I believe that experiment that's, that's carefully done and they can experimentally prove that if a wimp would scatter more than this, we would see it. Uh, the question is, however, restricted to a wimp with, a certain, with certain properties. So this is a wimp which interacts via weak interaction coherently on nuclei. Now, if you now invent another wimp, and you say, okay, my WIMP, my or my dark matter particle does not interact coherently with the nucleus, but it only interacts with the electrons in the electron in the in the in the in the atomic shell. Then this doesn't hold. So the, the, this, all these experiments explore a specific particle explanation of dark matter, and exclude that at present. If they would find something, they could prove it. But since they haven't found anything. They, they check this WIMP here hypothesis, and that's, uh, that's we can be very, very confident. And uh, it's actually, it's not a disadvantage that they only have these few counts. I think that's a huge, huge challenge that you make a detector such clean that in a ton detector, which you run for two years, you would see 10 nuclear recoils. That's an incredible achievement. So, uh, Okay, does this answer your question? Michel? That was very good. Thank you very much. Okay. So, uh, next is from Tan Wei Shen. Please. Um, okay. Um, can you explain how is the um, experiment process inside the detector? Um, for example, um, Signan or any detector? So I did not fully understand what you asked. So you asked for the physics process in the detector. Uh, yeah, how is the experiment uh, process for the, in the detector? Uh, the experiment, so uh, do you mean the physics process? So I, I could understand your question two ways. So uh, one is, let me see. So, uh, whoops, you see, this is the detector again. You ask me what, okay, do you see my mouse? So you ask me what happens here in physics or physics wise, or you ask me what the physicists do with the signals. Uh, the first one. The first one, okay. Yeah. Okay, the first one is, okay, basically what happens, you have a particle coming in, assume, make it simple, assume it's a photon, yes? This photon does photo effect or most likely a Compton scatter in the liquid xenon, so you have a high energy electron suddenly. So you have an electron which then ionizes the liquid xenon. Right, you have a track of the electron, a short track, a few micrometers, and along this track, you ionize the liquid. So you have positive uh, ions and negative electrons then separated. And now uh, a part of these electrons relaxes back, so recombines with the, with the xenon under the emission of light. So, uh, it, and it, but it takes a while. So these this energies, the electrons, these ener this ionization electrons, which are created, have quite a high energy. They have uh, 100 EV or so, far away from atomic binding energies. So they need to relax down in energy, producing another electrons. So there's a whole cloud of electrons being produced. And part of these electrons recombine, again, with the positive ions, producing light. So, and this light is emitted and this actually has a certain frequency. This is characteristic light of xenon, which you then see in the phototubes. So you could even uh, say this light needs to have a certain wavelength, otherwise it's not from the signal. So this is one thing what happens, but there is a part of the charges which do not recombine. And uh, they are, which take longer to recombine. And uh, this, this, uh, 
with discharges, you have a char chance to drift them away from the position and you drift them then through the liquid xenon. And then is uh, experimentally, it, it's, it's the, the point is along this path, when the charge drifts through the liquid xenon, these electrons also could be bound by molecules or by uh, uh, impurities in the detector. So the, the detector never is completely pure, but uh, the, the electrons could be catched, for example, by remnants of oxygen in the liquid xenon. So uh, if your xenon is not pure enough, you might lose your charges along the way. Then you are lost, then you do not see it. But if your xenon is pure enough and your field is high enough, then you can drift the charges up to the surface. And uh, of course, you could measure the electrons with electrodes. So for the large uh, CERN experiments, there are also such liquid xenon detectors, uh, but they measure the charges, um, they measure the charges by electrodes. But, but then, uh, uh, these electrodes in these detectors would introduce uh, uh, contaminations. So that why uh, in xenon one decides to measure without electrodes. And the trick is you extract the electrons into the gaseous phase. So up here is gas, xenon gas, down here is the liquid. You extract them in the gaseous phase. In the gaseous phase, they produce again light, similar like before. They ionize the gas, the gas is again uh, emitting light. And this you see as the secondary signal. So these are the physics processes happening here. And then uh, I, I said this was a photon starting here. If a WIMP comes in, a WIMP only gives a nuclear recoil to a xenon nucleus. And this xenon nucleus, if, it's, if it gets, let's say, one keV of energy, this keV of energy is enough, so it loses some of its electrons. And then you have again a positively charged nucleus running through the liquid, which ionizes the liquid. But this is, a, this is a much slower. So because it's a heavy nucleus with one keV, it's, it's much, much slower than an electron with one keV. That's why this nucleus with one keV, if you know the beta block formula for ionization, uh, uh, ionization depends on the speed of the charge going through your detector. So the speed of this liquid, the speed of this nuclear recoil is much, much lower than the speed of an electron at the same energy. That's why this nucleus produces much, much less light than the electron. And that's the trick how you distinguish the two. So from the light signal versus the charge signal. So this gives you this difference here in this plot where you can distinguish nuclear records from electron records. Okay, does this answer your question? Yes, it's a very good detailed explanation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. So you, you still have seven minutes. Do you want to continue? Or? I could uh, continue a little bit. Maybe that's, uh, I, could, okay. I could add to the slides, let's see, um, on on the low mass WIMPs, why low mass WIMPs are, so these are basically three slides and then we stop and do a break for half an hour, is that correct? Yes. Okay, good. So let's see, um, where do I have that file? Let's see, I have to clean up a little bit my desk here. <laughs> so this is this one, okay. Okay, here we are. Uh, <clears throat> or maybe, okay. Okay, no, I, I go with that, yes, okay. So, so here again is this plot, which I showed before. So, um, get the pointer. And okay, so um, this is again the plot uh, wimp mass versus cross section on nuclei um, in a double logarithmic scale. 
So here is uh, above a few GEV is the region where the liquid noble gas detectors are the best ones. And they are un unchallenged there at the moment. And I told you about Xenon, LZ, and in future Darwin, they will go all the way down here. Then uh, at the low wind masses, there are the cryogenic detectors. And I will just motivate now in a few minutes why the low wind masses are fashionable again. They haven't been 20 years ago, but now they are fashionable again because there are several model models which predict dark matter beyond the traditional wind mass window. So the traditional win window is GeV to 120 TeV, but uh, there are a few ideas and a few actually also very well motivated uh, ideas why dark matter could be very light. And I will just mention two. One is, is the name called asymmetric dark matter. So uh, from the numbers we get from cosmology, we know that the dark matter density it's around an omega of 23 or so, while the baryonic density, so the standard model particle, let's say, is on an omega of 0.04. So the dark matter density is five times the baryon density. So that's the observation from cosmology. So, um, and the standard picture for dark matter is, so which gives us the heavy dark matter is that the dark matter was an equilibrium in the early universe, but due to the weak interaction, it froze out. And this, this was left over, this was the leftover which produced us the, the, the dark matter. And the funny thing is this freeze out mechanism needs the weak interaction scale. And that's what's called the WIMP miracle. Why weak interaction is seen as being a connection to dark matter. Okay, this is how dark matter is in the standard picture being produced into the universe. Uh, <clears throat> the baryons, the baryon density is considered as being a leftover from an asymmetry between matter and antimatter. So the baryon density is, is related to CP violation. So the idea is in the early universe, we have matter and antimatter symmetric. Actually the standard model the standard model of particle physics expect the two be symmetric. And then uh, when the universe cools down, this matter and antimatter would completely annihilate and we would not be left with any matter at all. But there must have been a tiny asymmetry between matter and antimatter. So all the met most of the matter and antimatter annihilated, but a little bit of matter didn't find antimatter to annihilate, had no partners. And this asymmetry is on a level of 10 to the minus nine. And this is also being measured in cosmology because the ratio between the number of baryons we have and the number of photons we have is 10 to the nine. So we see there was a huge annihilation at the beginning in the universe. All the matter and antimatter annihilated, one billion protons annihilated with antiprotons, but one out of one billion was left without partner. So this is a measurement, we see that. And the funny thing is that between the production of matter in the universe and the production of dark matter in the universe, in this picture, there's no relation. And that's strange. So that's the weakness of the standard WIMP dark matter paradigm. So here in asymmetric dark matter, one says, one started completely differently. One says, okay, there must be a CP violation to produce this asymmetry between matter and antimatter. And the assumption now is that dark matter and normal dark matter share the same asymmetry. So there was an early pro pro process producing asymmetry between matter and antimatter. And it produced the same in the dark matter as in the normal matter sector. So that's also a very natural assumption. And then all the dark matter and the anti-dark matter annihilated and only this, this asymmetry dark matter was left over. The same process like in the matter production. And this tells you immediately that the mass of the dark matter, so this tells you that the number of dark matter particles is the same like the number of normal matter particles. And this tells you that the dark matter particle must have five times the mass of the proton because the dark matter density is five times the density of, pro of protons. So this gives you immediately a dark matter mass of five GeV. 
So this is weak. Uh, this is, is a small mass. So this is a low mass wind. And uh, you can tweak this 5 GeV down to below 1 GeV, of course, if you play a little bit around with the CP violation. Another thing has to do with the problem of n-body simulations of the, of the profile of galaxies. So this is the radius of a galaxy, and this is the density profile. And n-body simulations of, of structure formations tell you something like this, a very high mass density in the center. The measurements show you flatter curves in the center. So we have flatter dark matter profiles in the center of galaxies. And this is an open issue in astrophysics. It could be an issue, it could be a property of the dark matter. If you give dark matter some self-interaction, that dark matter can interact with, with itself. So the dark matter particles have some interactions among them. Then, uh, then you can uh, flatten this slope here. And uh, from the, from the calculations then, from the particle models, which I cannot go into the detail here, this self-interacting dark matter also brings you in the uh, dark ma matter mass range of only 100 MeV. So this is a tenth of a GeV. And these are just two examples of why low dark matter mass searches get, get, uh, also start to test models, reliable, very reasonable models. And this low mass region is very well motivated as for example, by this, by this uh, asymmetric dark matter things. And the liquid xenon detectors have a hard time to get there because the energy threshold is not low enough. As I told you at the beginning, as lower the wind mass, the lower are the energies of the recoil. So in this exclusion plots, if this is your exclusion plot, this is cross section against uh, WIMP mass, going this direction with your exclusion plot means you need a lower detection threshold. While going this direction needs, you need to reduce the overall background level. So of course you need both, you need also low background here, but the limit while these curves bend up here uh, uh, is, is due to the technical issue that all the detectors have an energy threshold. And only if you lower this threshold, you can go to the low wind masses. And this will bring me to cryogenic detectors after the break. Okay. And uh, I would stop here, Hesti, now. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Yosef. We will have a break now, but before that, uh, it's uh, traditional to have Group picture. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, smile. Anton, can you help help us to uh, take? Yeah. Okay, I will take picture. So, please uh, open your uh, video zone. Okay. Okay, I will start to take a picture for slide one. Okay, one, two, three. Second slide. Okay, wait a minute. Second slide. Okay. Okay, done. Thanks, everyone. Okay. So we reconvene at 11, yes? Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, four o'clock. Four o'clock. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Eleven for me. Okay. Okay. Eleven is yours. Okay. See you then. Okay.